For a long period of time in my life, I had this feeling like everyone that I loved and cared about, or respected or looked up to was on the other side of a canyon. And I'm just over here on this side by myself. And I knew that in order to get where they were, in order to basically like rejoin the world and rejoin humanity, I had to somehow build a bridge from where I was, where I wanted to be, so that I could cross this canyon. But I kept trying to build this bridge out of the things I was told I was supposed to be doing, my, my habits, my routines, my, my healthy lifestyle choices. And this bridge kept falling apart. And I would fall down into the canyon, climb back to the side I started on, and start to rebuild the bridge again. And I did this more times than I can count off the top of my head. When I finally figured out how to get across, I realized there were two mistakes that I had been making that were causing my bridge to crumble. So if that sounds a little bit like your story up until now, I think today's episode is going to really benefit you. Really quick, before I get into that, let me just briefly introduce myself. I'm Dr. Scott, a licensed clinical psychologist. I'm the host of the Psychology of Depression and Anxiety podcast. I'm the author of the book, For and Everything is Burning. And for those of you who've been here before, just a quick little update on what I'm up to. I'm currently working very hard on a workbook. I do not have an ETA. I have learned not to give ETAs because I am a chronic underestimator of how long things will take me. Um, I had a lot of the foundation built for this years ago because it's it's an adaptation of the workbook I use for the intensive outpatient programs that I run. And at first I thought I'll just kind of re rearrange and reorganize it so that it makes more sense to someone who's not in the program. But it turns out I've become a better writer since I made this. And so now I'm kind of revamping the whole thing. But it's definitely going to be probably definitely, I think, this year, hopefully sooner rather than later. So stay tuned for that. Okay, so back to this canyon and this bridge. I know that when that my problem, and I think what happens to a lot of people, is when we sense this separation from people or from the world, and it's like, okay, everyone else is over there, I'm here. First of all, some of that is a false perception, because there are other people who are actually on this same side with you. You are not the only person in the world who hasn't figured out how to get over there. But I know it can feel that way. And I know that when it feels that way, you feel rushed right? Like you feel behind, like I have to get to where everyone else already is. I have been left behind and I need to catch up in life. That sense of urgency needs to be present a little bit. Don't get me wrong. But if the sense of urgency is too high, that causes one of the two reasons that your bridge is going to collapse and you're going to end up not making it. I'm going to just really quick say those reasons and then we'll go into a lot of depth into why. Two reasons the bridge collapses. Reason number one, you don't know what order to build the bricks in. And I, I know bridges aren't really made with bricks. It's just a metaphor, but it just is easy to say. There is an order, okay? These bricks have to be placed in a certain order. And if you place them out of order, they don't stick together very well. The second reason is you don't put enough mortar around the bricks, meaning you aren't spending enough time letting these strategies or habits solidify and become able to stand on their own without your help before you move on to trying to place the next brick. Because as you're crossing this bridge, you have to stand on the part you've already made to place the next brick. And if you have not put that brick solidly in place, when you try to stand on it, it will fall. Now, that's all a very poetic metaphor, right? But what does it actually mean? Let me explain. The order of operations in in my this is this is my opinion. This is the way I've lived my life, and I've gotten pretty good results out of it. This is also the way that I do therapy individually and in groups, and I've gotten pretty good results out of that too. I believe that the correct order of operations for fixing your mental health is biological, psychological, and social in that order. Here's the reason I believe it needs to be in that order. Biological resources, that's my starting point, with everybody, unless they're already, unless they come into therapy really resourced in that area already, then we'll just do kind of a quick touch up and then we'll move on to the next. But for many people, we spend a lot of time there. Sometimes we spend years on the biological component. And when I say the biological component of your mental health, just for clarity, I'm referring to things like your sleep hygiene, your nutrition, your physical activity, your if you're on psychiatric medications, your compliance with those medications, your uh, management of substance intake, even 
common legal substances like alcohol or caffeine for that matter. These are the biological components of your mental health. In other words, these things physically affect the health of your brain. And the reason we start there is everything else we're going to do is, is technical and complicated. Psychological and social resources require a lot of brain power in order to use them. You have to think about them. You have to be focused. You have to remember. Your brain has to be functioning physically pretty well to be able to do these more advanced techniques. And especially with things like depression and anxiety, our brains often are not functioning well because all of those physical resources that are biological, I guess I called them, all of those biological building blocks that I just mentioned are affected by your mental health. This is where it gets frustrating. They both affect and are affected by your mental health. So if you're in a depressive episode, if you've had a prolonged period of anxiety, you're probably not sleeping great. You're probably not eating great. It's difficult to find the time and energy to be physically active. You might be more prone to overusing substances. These are all pretty normal impacts of mental health struggles, but they create a vicious cycle where they reduce our brain's physical health. And when our brain is less physically healthy, it is less able to do things like think through stressful situations, regulate emotions, have healthy interactions with other people. And so we end up in this downward spiral because the mental health problem caused a physical health problem and the physical health problem worsens the mental health problem and they just build off each other down into oblivion. So the starting point is to really work on those fundamental building blocks of your biological health. And when I say you need to have these bricks set in place, let me explain what I mean by that. You need to spend way more time than you think on these things to get them to stand on their own. The goal is to get to a point with each of these resources, each of these critical tools, that they don't need any more effort or management from you to remain in place. So basically, we're trying to build self-sustaining subconscious habits. This is way harder and takes way longer than most people. It, well, it's not harder. It just takes longer. It's not actually that hard. The only thing about it that's hard, honestly, is consistency. It is, it's hard for people to be consistent under good circumstances in many cases, right? And of course, things like depression and anxiety make it even harder for us to be consistent because our mood, our motivation fluctuates more than it does for the average person on a daily basis, sometimes with no apparent rhyme or reason. That's why this is crucial. Because if we can get these habits so ingrained in you that they do not require attention or resources from you to sustain them, even under the worst of circumstances, you have set a foundation on this bridge that you will not crumble unless you dismantle it. It is stuck in place. It is there to stay. And the way you do that is by sticking with it for way longer than you think. I know there's a lot of really optimistic data about there, uh, out there, I should say, about how long it takes to build a habit. So I've seen a lot of literature that says like it takes 10 days to build a habit or, or something like that. The different time frames you see around this topic depend on how are they defining a habit. A lot of the time when someone's talking about building a habit, they just mean that you get to the point where you don't literally forget that you're trying to do this thing. And they say, if you remember that you want to like brush your teeth or something, you've now formed a habit. That's not my definition of a habit. My definition is you would have to purposely choose not to do it. So to give you an example, I've been working out um, since I was... 20, I think, and I'm 40 now, so half my life. I would have to make a conscious, it, I, I, have a, I don't work out every day, but I have, a, I have a schedule and I've been on this schedule for so long, it requires zero conscious thought from me. It is as subconscious and automatic to me as it is for a lot of people to wake up and, and make a cup of coffee. Like you, you have to choose not to do it. Your, your natural inertia will just carry you through to doing it. But it takes a while. It doesn't take 20 years necessarily, right? But that is the goal. So one brick at a time. And you do not want to move from this one element that you're working on until you can stand on that brick. So work on one thing at a time and give it way more time that you think it needs. Get it to the point 
where you would have to consciously choose not to do it. That's the point we're looking for where we say, I can now stand on this and I am ready to place that next brick in the bridge. So that being said, once you've got those foundational elements of your biological mental health in place, and again, just for review, that's going to be sleep hygiene, physical activity, nutrition, medication compliance if you're on medications, and management of intake of substances. You don't need to be perfectionistic about it, okay? There's always, this, this is where it gets a little tricky, especially with anxiety. There's a lot of overlap between anxiety and perfectionism. So there will always be room for improvement in every single one of those domains. You, you you won't master one of them, let alone all of them. You just won't. We don't we don't reach mastery on multiple things. So it's not that you're trying to get to the point where there is no longer any room for improvement, because then you'll never progress. Then you'll have the opposite problem of what most people have. Most people rush this process. You'll get stuck if you expect perfection out of yourself. It's just about getting to the point where you don't have to think about it anymore and you would have to choose not to do it. That's the point we're looking for to move on. Once we've got all of those foundational elements of our biological health in place, then we move on to the second set of bricks and that's psychological. Psychological components of mental health are going to include things like being able to challenge your maladaptive or unhealthy thoughts, Understanding when a belief system from the past is getting triggered, understanding when you only believe something because of repetitive exposure rather than because it's an actual logical truth. This is going to involve mindfulness strategies. So things like being able to, at least at times, choose the direction of your attention and not always just get pulled in by the shiny thing. And the shiny thing in most of our lives actually is the scary thing. So that we're not just constantly focused on the worst parts of our lives and thinking that everything is worse than it really is. This is going to be emotion regulation. So your ability to experience stressors and challenges in life and not feel like everything's falling apart all the time. Now, just as a little aside, because I know I just said a lot of very complicated, very technical things. The purpose of today's content is just to provide an overview of this bridge. Every single brick in this bridge is its own piece of content. Many of them I've made already. Some of them I'm going to make in the future. There are also many other people who've spoken on these topics. So this is not a how to on how to put each brick in, because each of that could be a multiple hour piece of content. This is just the overview, okay? So if you're like, oh, he went through that so quick, I don't feel like I know how to do any of those things. That Those are separate. This is just the really, really big picture, zoomed out map for crossing this canyon. I hope that makes sense because I you know it's frustrating when people like say a thing that you should do and then don't explain how to do it. But this would be a 10 hour video and I, I don't have 10 hours today because I have to work. <laughs> anyway, sorry. Psychological is second. Now again, I just want to I just want to give a little interjection here. The reason we don't, the reason I don't, some people do. The reason I don't start with these things is think about a person who is exhausted, right? Someone who's struggling with at least like some mild insomnia, maybe worse. Let's say you're sleeping five hours a night. Let's say you're eating one meal and two snacks a day. Let's say you're sedentary. Let's say you're overusing alcohol and caffeine at least. And let's say you're not totally consistent with your psych meds. So your, your brain, and no offense, this isn't meant to be mean or judgmental. This is just like a statement of fact. Your brain is kind of a mess in that in that case, right? It's not working very well. And you feel like a mess. I Like, I know that feeling. This isn't me calling you out and saying, wow, you suck at life. This is me saying, I know what that's like, and it's awful. When you're in that state, and people tell you, let's use your critical thinking skills to challenge your maladaptive belief systems. And you're like, I'm not even awake yet today. <laughs> it, it's a mismatch. All right. That, that person is not meeting you where you're at. Person, and this could be a therapist, right? Who's telling you to do these things and, and your brain is not in a place where it can. They're, they're showing a misunderstanding of where you're at in the process of building this bridge and what you need. Um, so that's why I don't start with those things. I don't think that they're good starting points. The, the psychological resources, uh, the, the middle part of this bridge, 
as a therapist, this is what most of our training is about. So this is why I think a lot of therapists focus so hard on this middle section, because this is what we're trained the most to do. Most of what I know about the biological stuff, I've had to seek out elsewhere. And that's even, I even had a specialty in health psychology when I got my doctorate. So I focused more on that than most people. And I still felt very unprepared, very unprepared to talk to people about their physical health. I had to seek out a lot of extracurricular knowledge to be able to speak intelligently on those topics and help people with them. So like that's, I'm not making excuses for people. I'm just saying that's why it happens. It's because our training programs, I think are really inadequate for the mental health needs of most people who come seeking treatment. Tangent unsuccessfully avoided. That one got me. Sorry about that. That was probably interesting to like 5% of you who work in mental health and most of you may not care, but let's get back on track. So at this point, now again, same rules apply to the psychological part. Take your time with these, okay? I know, I know you just want to get there. I know you feel like you're in a rush. I know you feel like everyone's ahead of you and you just want to catch up. But if you rush this process and try to move across this bridge too quickly before that mortar sets and before your bricks are ready to be stand, stood, standed, stood upon, you'll fall. You'll fall right back into that hole You'll have to drag yourself out and you'll probably have to start the whole process all over again. Or at least now, this is this is why I like this metaphor. If some of those bricks were really set in place, they'll still be there when you crawl out of that hole. So let's say you got your biological stuff really like just completely dialed in, but you rushed the psychological part of it. After the fall, and after you climb out of that hole, that first third of your bridge is still there. Because you built it so sturdily. So I'm saying so many words that I don't know if they're real words today. So just bear with me. So meticulously, so so strongly, even after a fall, it's still there. That's why I want you to take your time with this stuff. Because if you build in skills and tools and strategies that you can never lose, even under the worst of circumstances, then you always have some sense of tangible progress. You always have a base to stand on and it will take less time to get where you want to be. So this is one of those times where slower is faster and faster is slower. Like it's, I know this is so cliche, but it's, it's the tortoise and the hare. It's about consistency, not going in sprints. That's the name of the game with mental health. It's a long game. It's not a, it's not a fix it quick kind of thing. Is there's no, there's no mental health flex tape. Okay, like this is a long, arduous process, but it's worth it because if you do it right, it actually works and it can change your entire life. Second, uh, that wasn't a tangent. I think that was on topic enough that I don't need to call it a tangent. So biological, psychological. Third is social. Now, the reason we save social for last is it's really hard. Another cliche, I know, I'm going to say it in a slightly less cliche way than you're used to hearing it, but there is there is a fundamental truth to this. It is difficult to have healthy relationships with other people. Well, A, if physically you're unhealthy, right? Again, if, if your brain is just not working right, it's hard to engage skillfully with other people. But my social is is the third and also after psychological is that it's very difficult to have healthy relationships with other people if we don't have at least a semi-healthy relationship with ourselves. Because although most of us, most of us treat ourselves way worse than we would treat other people, there is still some bleed over. And, and the relationship we have with ourselves, we bring that to our relationships with other people. If you hate yourself, if you are incredibly harsh with yourself, if you're incredibly critical with yourself, you won't do it all the time. But when you're really stressed out, when tensions are high, when patience is low, some of that will get projected onto other people because that's how your subconscious mind operates. And not every interaction you have with another human being is a fully conscious process. It will be at first, like if it's someone you don't know, or you're just starting to date someone, or you just get a brand new job or whatever, at first you're gonna be on, right? Because you're gonna be focusing and thinking really hard about this relationship. Inevitably, when we have long-term relationships, and that this is just this is just factual, this is not something to feel bad about, but. Some of that relationship will occur on autopilot. We can't, even the most extroverted person among us is not on 24-7. We all have downtime. 
And, and when our brains are not on socially, that's when our external relationships kind of revert to the quality of our internal relationship. And they fall to, how well do I treat myself? If I treat myself poorly, I'm probably going to not be a great person to other people when I'm in that autopilot mode, when my guard is down and I'm not focusing on their needs and their wants and their feelings. So I really believe it is crucial to work on yourself first. Now, again, I'm not saying you have to be perfect. I'm not saying don't get out there and try to make friends or try to find a partner or try to have kids until you are like fully healed. That's crap. That's not real. But you got to be at least like semi-okay-ish or else you might find a really great person and not be able to maintain the relationship. And Some of you might have had that happen. And that also sucks. So the social component of your mental health, that's going to include things like your psychosocial boundaries, knowing how much to let in, how much to let out, assertiveness, being able to advocate for yourself, vulnerability, being able to articulate your emotions. I'm a big fan of the feelings wheel. I'll probably do a whole piece of content on that later. But this, these skills here is your third section. And that's what really creates that grid. It Once you've got solid bricks in all three of those sections, that's when I think you'll have that moment where you finally find, I can cross this bridge. I feel like I am back in the world again. Or, you know, I say back in the world, but I know for some of us, this stuff started so early, we feel like we've always been on the other side. It's like it, it, we've never been over here. That doesn't mean you can't be. It's, I, I really believe, like, I know, I know the bridge obviously is a metaphor, but at the end of the day, Mental health, I, I believe, mostly follows the laws of physics, meaning if you've got your biological stuff dialed in, if you've got your psychological stuff dialed in, and you got your social stuff dialed in, like you really have focused on these things and you have a high skill level at all of them, barring just like endless horrible luck, you're probably going to have a pretty good life. And you have everything in place that will be constantly propelling you in that direction. There's always random chance in life. There's always unknown, but you put yourself in the best possible situation. Now, that's the core of what I want to talk to you guys about today. Those are the three steps, the biopsychosocial model. I'm going to add a little bit of bonus content here at the end. And before I get into my bonus content, I'm going to give a disclaimer. This is going to be different than what I usually talk about for two reasons. Reason number one, it's going to be more personal than what I usually discuss. Reason number two, it's going to be a little bit about spirituality, which is a topic I've really never discussed on this channel before. Some of you may not have any interest in hearing me talk about spirituality. That's okay. I, I, I believe that for anybody, you do the three things I've already talked about, it's going to make a huge difference in your life. It, 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 it's going to help tremendously. So if that's where you want to cut it off and you say, I, I don't want to hear what he has to say on this topic, no harm done. I'll see you next time. Totally okay. For those of you who do want to hear a little more about this, my full in my personal life, I don't ever push this on anyone I work with. It's their call. In my personal life, there was a fourth component to this. And, and it's it's like different. It doesn't quite fit in the bridge. It's it's almost more like a foundation of the bridge, if that makes sense. And that's spirituality. I got the first three sections in place a while ago, and my life got a lot better when I had them in place, my brain, if you, and if you relate to this, then th this might be important for you to hear. My brain from a very young age has had a bad habit of asking questions that I don't know how to answer. Questions that not being able to answer like plunges me into despair. Questions like, why am I doing any of this? Like, I, I can't answer that question. You know, it's, I can be physically and mentally healthy and have a great social life. Okay, for what? What does that do? What is the point of that? It makes me a little happier. It's I'm not the kind of person who's ever felt like that was enough. Because I have this very, very strong, like nihilistic voice in my mind that anytime I do something kind of does the like sarcastic clap. It's like, oh, good job. You're sleeping better. You, you must be so proud of yourself. Who cares? And yeah, it sucks to live with that. But I do. I just I just do. And for me, finding a sense of purpose or meaning or understanding in the world that was greater than something I could come up with on my own is what has helped quiet that voice and what ultimately 
has helped form a foundation for this bridge. And even when I'm really, really in my head about big picture stuff, essentially gives me like okay. an answer. And, and, you know, a lot of different viewpoints out there for what the answer is. Um, but I do think that if you're somebody like me, who tends to wonder a lot about the really big picture stuff and, and gets easily overcome by feelings of like meaninglessness and like, I can do all that stuff, but for what and for why spirituality might be an important, probably is. I'm, I'm, I'm going to be stronger on that. I'm going to say is going to be an important part of your journey because that's what can underpin the whole thing. And, and, you know, those three parts of the bridge is the what they can, it can't give you a why biopsychosocial model doesn't give you a why it doesn't answer like the why are we here type questions and and so if if your brain asks those questions of you a lot i think you'll probably need some sort of like spirituality to be able to answer those questions and for me personally in the last couple of years in particular i've really recognized like faith was the piece that i was missing so that's just my little Again, I don't talk about that. I'm still a little uncomfortable talking about that. You can probably tell by the sudden shift in tone in how I speak. Um, I'm very comfortable talking about things that I can, you know, scientifically demonstrate and and know are true in a like tangible, here it is kind of way. This is newer for me. So, you know, thank you for uh, tolerating my clumsiness around that issue. That's all I got for you guys today. I hope this content was helpful and I'll see you next time. Take care.